Hello, I'm the Reverend Brett Hayes. I'm here in Oak Grove Cemetery because so many of the early parishioners of St. John's are buried here. These key parish leaders enabled St. John's to open her doors for the first time in 1863, and their hard work and generosity made it possible for the parish to weather the difficult years of the 19th century. You'll see in this segment how the city of Gloucester was transformed in this period into a fishing boom town. And then, in the late 19th century, Gloucester became a fashionable summer resort for the wealthy. Many of these people, being Episcopalians, started worshiping at St. John's, and their generosity enabled desperately needed improvements to be made to the parish. Echoing the charter of the Church of the Advent, Article 1 of St. John's Constitution promises to secure to the members thereof and others the ministrations of the Holy Catholic Church free from assessment and unnecessary expense. Having been created to specifically serve the needs of churchless Episcopalians, but also of working-class itinerant fishermen, the new church opened its doors in 1864 with a sign announcing, Seats Free. Since the 1850s, young men had been pouring into Gloucester from Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Scandinavia, drawn to the potentially lucrative fishing trades. They also came from Portugal, but the influx of Mediterranean-born fishermen would not be in great numbers for a few decades. By the Civil War, these men filled a vacuum created by the 1600 Gloucestermen who were off serving the Union in the Army and Navy. The ones serving in the Army suffered horrendous casualties. 28% were either killed or wounded. In spite of this, by the war's end in 1865, Gloucester's overall population had grown by a third, with 4,730 men in the fisheries. Gloucester became the primary fishing community in America, but not only because of its proximity to George's Bank. Of significance was the development of transcontinental railroads, the use of scientific methods of food preparation, and improvements in schooner design, sails, and nets. And it wasn't just steady work that lured men down from Canada. Unique to Gloucester was its system of cooperative insurance by which the loss of a ship would be divided among all the investors of the port. And unlike other places, the crews were promptly paid in cash at the end of every voyage. <laughs> Gloucester's prayer book Christians, as the Episcopalians were called, had been patriotic supporters of the Union effort. They were of equal social status to any of the merchants who lived on Middle Street. Many of their names are familiar to this day. Stacy, Thompson, Hammond, Babson, and Dale. John H. Stacy was St. John's first senior warden and the man who signed the contract for the building of the church in 1864. He remained senior warden for the rest of his life. His 37-year service now seems unimaginable. As many of the early rectors lasted only a few years, Stacy was the glue that held the parish together. A proprietor of a successful clothing store on Main Street, John Stacy's residence was 44 Middle Street just two doors down from the church. He lived with his wife Sarah and his maiden sisters Mary and Flora, who ran the Stacy Academy, a private school for well-bred boys and girls. Alfred Mansfield Brooks, who attended school there in the 1870s, later devoted several pages on the Academy in his autobiography, Gloucester Recollected. According to Brooks, Sarah was a taskmaster John did his best to avoid manual labor, which could shed light on his attraction to church business. The carefully attired Stacy would rarely miss a Sunday morning service. But Mrs. Stacy had little admiration for her husband's devotion to St. John's, and with almost equal regularity, could be heard noisily splitting firewood through the windows in the nave as the service was progressing. 
When Stacy died in 1900, he was buried in Oak Grove Cemetery, where we can find the final resting place of many of St. John's founding parishioners. John's son, James, took over the day-to-day -day management of Stacy's clothing store by the time he was 20, and continued the business for 60 years. When it closed after his death in 1941, it was the longest-running business on Main Street. Charles Perkins Thompson, the most prominent lawyer in Gloucester, came to town in 1857. He was the man who officially called together the meeting of the Episcopal Society to incorporate the parish. A critical benefactor along with Theron Dale, Thompson served in the Massachusetts House in the 1870s and was elected to the U.S. Congress in 1874. Charles' wife, Abby Thompson, was one of the first of the many women over the years who have tirelessly worked behind the scenes to support the parish. She was instrumental in founding the Ladies' Parish Aid Society and served as its president for 25 years. Under her direction, the ladies began a tradition that is still very much alive today. They sewed all year round making goods for the church fair, which was even then an important fundraiser. In his History of St. John's, written for the 90th anniversary, Sumner Vibert described Abby Thompson as a loving, gracious woman whose personal charm made a lasting impression on all whom she knew. Later, their daughter Grace Thompson became an ardent, lifelong supporter of St. John's. In the first part of the 20th century, Grace spent years raising money to pay the choir boys, who by then were typically paid 15 cents per Sunday. William Babson was the eldest son of John James Babson, Gloucester's foremost intellectual. The moderator of that first meeting to incorporate the church, he became the original treasurer and served several years as either warden or treasurer until the 1880s. He worked as a cashier of the Gloucester National Bank. Mary Isabel Wyman came to Gloucester in 1855 to teach in the girls' high school and was made principal the following year. She fell in love with William Babson, and they were married in 1861. The two were among the Episcopal Society members who worshipped out of Magnolia Hall. Mary Isabel served on the board of the Sanitary Commission, the predecessor of the Red Cross, throughout the Civil War. Her only brother was killed as a colonel leading his regiment in the summer of 1862. John Soames Weber, the civil engineer who also signed the contract to build the church in 1864, was an ardent supporter who gave generously when the church was in financial straits until he died in 1890. His sons, John Jr. and William, later served as officers of the church. Henry E. Merchant, the first junior warden, was a tailor and proprietor of a summer boarding house. Franklin K. Woodbury, a merchant, was the first clerk in 1863 and the organist from 1865 to 1867. Unmarried, he lived with his father Obadiah at 33 Middle Street. And Alfred Fitz Stickney followed Woodbury as clerk and later was a vestryman. Stickney was a newspaper editor of the Cape Ann Advertiser, The Telegraph, and from its inception, the Gloucester Daily Times. A talented stenographer he was elected Clerk of the Common Council for the City of Gloucester in 1888. With little money coming in from the substantial itinerant portion of the parish, and with tradesmen being paid for debts stemming from the construction, Reverend Joshua Pierce was forced to leave St. John's in 1865 to take an assistant rector job in Boston. The diocese followed up by placing Reverend James Stack and then Reverend Frank Winkley to each serve a year term while a more suitable person could be found for the job. Reverend James Reed took the position in 1868 and was to become the first rector to spend a significant time at St. John's, serving for the next nine years. 
The early parish histories give Reed credit for the growth of the parish and mention his deep spiritual nature and hard work. He had a wife and daughter. As with other rectors from this period, he was described as not being very strong physically and ultimately would leave when he felt his poor health was restricting him from effectively performing his duties. In August of 1871, Theron Dale died suddenly at his summer home in Gloucester. He was 43 years old and still a bachelor. He was described as a man of sterling worth and virtue, and the achievement which beyond all other acts of his life gave him the greatest pleasure was his success in founding the Episcopal Church in Gloucester. Dale's funeral was an emotional affair at St. John's. The Right Reverend William Croswell Doane, the Bishop of Albany, performed the service with Reverend Reed. In a preface to the published record of James Reed's eulogy, Doane states, The church in Gloucester, reaching with its consolations a number of suffering people, and people whose lives are in daily peril by the sea, owed its existence to him. And as he was born into it on Friday, it was his fittest memorial, no cenotaph, but a living monument full of power and grace and life. The church was fragrant and beautiful with flowers, passion flowers for us and resurrection flowers for him. But on his coffin made of oak, made in the old shape and covered with purple cloth, was nothing. Not even a nail, or a handle of metal, nor a flower. Only the cross, the full length, and a wreath of green oak leaves. Reverend Reed spoke for some time in comforting tones, describing the moment of death. At the end of his eulogy, he said, If in time to come any shall ask concerning him who now so many may mourn, then let someone lead them hither, and say that this house of God, in its lowly simple beauty, in its living spiritual ministers, is his most fitting memorial. Dale was buried at the family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery. A stone mural tablet, donated by the Church of the Advent, was affixed to the wall in the sanctuary near where our organ is today, a visual reminder of the blessing that was Theron Dale. Its inscription echoed the words Bishop Doan included on Dale's coffin plate, Thou shalt see greater things than these. Four months later, a letter was received from the executors of the Dale estate. It contained the news that Theron's will arranged for the settlement of the mortgage on the church building. With this debt settled, Bishop Paddock consecrated St. John's on September 18th of 1874. As there was no rectory, the clergyman robed at the Stacy's and processed down Middle Street to the church. Dale's siblings, continued his $1,000 annual pledge in his honor. In 1876, after nine years of service, Reed left St. John's to minister elsewhere. When he died in Webster, Massachusetts a few years later, his body was returned to Gloucester for a funeral at St. John's. He is buried with the Stacys in Oak Grove Cemetery. Reverend William Hooper served the following five years, but was not up to the task physically. Although St. John's was successful with mission work, its finances were hand-to-mouth for most of the first three decades. Several times, the parish required infusions from the diocese. We cannot understate the importance of the generosity of the Thompson and Weber families who provided financial assistance during these times. Many members had meager income, and a box of clothes was kept at the back of the church for anyone in need. Hooper left in 1882 due to poor health, but one of his accomplishments was the resumption of regular services in Rockport, an effort that had been begun with Reed. 
Reverend Charles Hayden came to Gloucester with his wife and two children and served as rector for eight years until 1890. Under his leadership, the church began again to grow in numbers. Hayden completed the formation of a congregation in Rockport, which was soon known as St. Mary's Mission. During this time, until well into the 20th century, there were 2,000 unattached fishermen living in Gloucester boarding houses. The majority were men from the Maritimes. Although many of these were Anglicans, a large number were Scandinavian Lutherans. These men attended St. John's whenever they could, as they prepared themselves spiritually for the rigors of the North Atlantic. The young rectors of St. John's repeatedly petitioned the diocese to set up a mission on the waterfront. This ultimately resulted in the founding of the Fisherman's Institute on Duncan Street in 1895. This was designed as a club where the men could relax between voyages in an alcohol-free environment. They read papers, played checkers, and could use showers and lockers. It was strictly Protestant but non-denominational and generously supported by St. John's. 1884 was the year of the greatest fish landings by pound. Gloucester Harbor was home to 501 vessels, of which 415 were schooners. To support this booming industry, Gloucester's fish-related infrastructure flourished. By 1870, there were 30 fish curing establishments, most with their own wharves, and 60 companies listed as wholesale fish dealers. Ancillary businesses proliferated, creating everything from anchors to dories to sails to foghorns. There were fish byproduct companies that sold fish guano, fish oil, and soap. There were firms that made oiled clothing for fishermen and Gloucester could boast the largest ice house in Massachusetts on Fernwood Lake in West Gloucester. Yet the fisheries during the days of sail had to be the most dangerous livelihood in the world. In 1879, the worst year, 249 men were lost in 29 vessels, 15 of which went down in a single storm on February 21st and 22nd. In the 17 year span from 1880 to 1897, Gloucester lost 264 boats, 1,614 fishermen.
Of all the hundreds of Anglican and Lutheran fishermen who came down to Gloucester from Canada, the most iconic and possibly the most famous was Howard Blackburn. Although we can only assume he attended services at St. John's, both from his heritage and by the fact his funeral was held there, Blackburn exemplifies the toughest of the men working during the great days of the Gloucester fisheries. Arriving from Nova Scotia in 1880, he joined the crew of the Grace L. Fears. Two years later, fishing halibut off Newfoundland, his dory was separated from the main boat in rough seas, snow, and fog. Rowing for days without sleep, freezing wet, and with his dorymen dead beside him, he found rescue by brute endurance and a miraculous will to survive. The trip cost him his fingers, toes, and half of one foot. He returned to Gloucester, crippled, at the age of 24. After gratefully accepting $500 raised for him by a local newspaper, he set up a tobacco business on what is now Main Street. Just before Christmas in 1885, he returned the money for the benefit of fishermen's widows and orphans. He began selling liquor in 1886, and his Blackburn Tavern became the best-known saloon in the city. But Howard Blackburn was not content to spend his life off the sea. By the turn of the 20th century, he had successfully sailed single-handedly across the Atlantic, twice. His tiny sloop, Great Republic, can be seen today in the Cape Ann Museum. Beginning in the 1880s, something else occurred which would shape the history of both Gloucester and St. John's. Gloucester was quickly becoming a popular summer destination for the leisure class. By then, electric trolley cars could bring people from downtown to Rocky Neck, Anasquam, and Lanesville. Several enormous hotels were constructed. Wealthy people began to arrive to summer here from all over the country. They built sumptuous houses on Cape Ann, and because many of these were Episcopalians, they started attending services at St. John's. Between 1892 and 1902, John Mills served as rector, coming from the Church of the Advent in Boston. Father Mills understood that for St. John's to survive, it needed to leverage the support of these wealthy summer residents. His efforts towards this made a great difference. From this point on, in the years before the Great Depression, these people provided a third of the money necessary to run the parish each year. Several deaths shook the parish in this period, notably Charles Thompson, who was by then the distinguished judge of the Superior Court, Joshua Pierce, St. John's first rector, and in February the following year, Vestryman Captain John Vibert and his entire crew were lost at sea. The newspaper account of the tragic loss of the Samuel V. Colby minced no words, saying, Given up, all hope gone, the good craft which sailed away many weeks ago will never return. Her timbers long before this are at the bottom of Sable Island's treacherous shores, and her crew of brave and hardy men have closed their book of life. The article also said this about Captain Vibert. Captain Vibert, master, resided at 98 Maplewood Avenue, 50 years old, and leaves a widow and three children. He was one of the most experienced masters sailing from this port for over 20 years. He has been a good fisherman and deservedly popular he was a genial and kind friend and an affectionate husband and father. His vessel was the fourth that winter lost in the herring fishery. Although St. John's rectors had been preaching occasional services in the summer hotels, Bishop Lawrence made sure that Cape Ann had Episcopal summer services in no less than five different locations. Now, affluent businessmen from all over the country from places like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Kansas City, 
could attend summer worship in pleasant surroundings on Eastern Point in Magnolia and Rockport. Father Mills organized the first boys' choir and St. Andrew's Brotherhood for Men. Mills also saw to the creation of an endowment fund. It was named the Beach Fund after Mrs. Beach, who donated bank stock shares for this purpose. Once these wealthy members were spiritually attached to the modest church on Middle Street, Reverend Mills began to find willing donors to make desperately needed renovations or acquisitions. In 1895, with the help from the Beach Fund and generous summer parishioners, Father Mills purchased the exquisite altar in Raridas and had it dedicated to the memory of Reverend James Reed. This is one of the first altars to be designed by church architect Ralph Adams Cram, who would later go on to design the Church of St. John the Divine in New York City. The Raridas, or screen above the altar, has the figure of Christ as its central theme. There are two rows of saints grouped around the central figure. The top row shows from left to right Peter, Matthew, and Mary the mother of Jesus, John, Luke, and Mark. The bottom row shows from left to right the saints of the Anglican Church. Edward the Confessor, who was responsible for the building of Westminster Abbey, St. Alban the Martyr, Paul the Apostle, Andrew the Apostle, Gregory the Great, Bishop of Rome, and finally Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who defied King Henry II. In 1895, Abby Thompson donated gas chandeliers in memory of her husband Charles, and then followed in 1897 with a donation of funds for an addition off the right side of the church. Its purpose was to serve as the desperately needed choir room. We continue to call this wing off the church the Thompson Room to this day. With the dedication of the Raridas, with its very medieval, very English saints, 1895 was the high watermark of the Oxford movement's influence on St. John's. After that year, things became much more in tune with the regular Protestant Episcopal style, which valued preaching over elaborate liturgy and morning prayer over frequent communion. This was because the diocese was in the capable hands of Bishop William Lawrence. Nicknamed the Banker's Bishop for his fundraising skills, he was quoted as once having said, In the long run, it is only to the man of morality that wealth comes. We, like the psalmists, occasionally see the wicked prosper, but only occasionally. Godliness is in league with riches. Lawrence was a successful man among successful men, and he realized that the church could appeal to businessmen and their families if it offered middle-class amenities and preached a gospel of optimistic service. He put in his own young men as rectors, the first at St. John's, being Rev. A. A. Binnington in 1903, and four years later, Rev. Charles Tyndall. Like Lawrence, Tyndall was a traditionalist, and for him to come to St. John's, the vestry had to agree to several of his demands. These included the removal of the sanctuary lamp, the removal of the Benedictus from the communion service, and the cessation of singing the creeds, the confession, and the Lord's Prayer. He would also control the matter of acolytes, and candles were to be completely at his discretion. In 1906, the vestry voted to purchase Elwell House for a rectory. It was located at 165 Washington Street, next to Oak Grove Cemetery. With help from Bishop Lawrence, Tyndall was able to persuade the great mining engineer John Hayes Hammond Sr. to pay the $4,000 loan for the house by the following year. Socially, this was the heyday of the wealthy summer people, especially the ever-generous Hammond, who had a particular compassion for the simple, rugged fishermen and provided them with a special burial ground at Beechbrook in West Gloucester 
and the Cape Ann Fisherman's Home at 136 Eastern Avenue. He was also a great benefactor of St. John's and would soon be instrumental in helping to finance the much needed parish hall. The Raymond Pollard and Rhinelander families were other generous donors among the summer colony. After Reverend Tyndall had the new ST pipe organ installed at a cost of $1,800, his young daughter became ill. He and his wife decided her best chance for recovery would be a warmer climate. As 1907 came to a close, Tyndall resigned to take a position in the South. The vestry invited Reverend Joseph Cooper to supply the service on January 28, 1908. Cooper was so impressive that two days later he was offered a full-time position at the annual salary of $1,500. Upon his acceptance, the vestry empowered him to hold Sunday services at the Moreland Casino and the Hawthorne Inn at Bass Rocks. Cooper would stay for 28 years, the longest tenure of any rector at St. John's. He would bring a period of unparalleled prosperity in continuity to the parish. The little church in Gloucester that endured the nickname God's Barn was thriving. Meanwhile, the town jokingly called Gloucester by the smell, as opposed to Manchester by the sea, underwent its own vindication when Tablet Rock was dedicated at Stage Fort Park in 1907. With the population 30,000 strong, Gloucester was now the oldest continuous settlement in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Along with the social transformation provided by the wealthy, the fishing industry was also transformed, with technology once again being the catalyst. The first fishing vessel with an internal combustion engine was launched in 1903. This caused a rapid changeover from the wind-powered schooners so commonly seen in Gloucester Harbor with their stacked dories and large crews. The move away from sailing vessels to smaller steel-hulled diesel-powered trawlers equipped with large mechanized nets had another profound effect. These vessels simply did not need as many men. By the time of the 1910 census, it was obvious that fewer young unattached fishermen were coming down from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. With the advent of World War I in 1914, thousands were drawn instead to the Canadian Army, eventually to sacrifice their lives in the mud in Belgium and France. The ones who did come were family men who settled and took American citizenship. The families they created were to be the backbone of St. John's for the next 50 years. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. 